Today at JW Pepper, actually, we're not at JW Pepper. Today, we're at Fishers High School in Fishers, Indiana, and their front ensemble has something that they want to show you. <laughs> JDB Pepper had the chance to spend a few days with the Fishers High School Marching Band, some of the most amazing marching arts performers in the country. One of their directors, Chad Kohler, was able to give us an in-depth look at all the tech that goes into one of the best front ensembles performing today. We go over what instruments and what gear they use, as well as how you can implement some of this stuff for some smaller ensembles as well. The front ensemble houses 20 members currently right now, and they're comprised of mallet players, instrumental players that play auxiliary percussion, electronic percussion, drum set, timpani, and the like. So it's a full complement of the percussion orchestra. They are comprised of high school students, and we also allow eighth graders with appro approval of their director and with an audition that's placed in front of us. So um, that comprises where we are. Obviously, with what transpired with COVID and so forth, every program around the country has lost members. So We've been regaining new membership and we've been trying to attract some of the eighth graders so that way when they're here as a freshman and sophomore year, they have a lot more knowledge, they know what they're doing, they feel more acclimated, and they're honestly gonna be our future leaders. Faculty that teach the marching band program here, especially with percussion, they are the junior high directors. So they work with sixth grade all the way up through 12th grade. So a lot of the students study with the same private instructor from sixth through 12th grade. So we get to know the, the student from sixth grade through 12th grade They've uh, had an, an embedded, uh, I guess, pedagogy and vernacular with, that's been consistent, that's been thrown to them uh, all the way through. So it's been pretty exciting to see them maturize through the journey. All of our percussionists start with a bell kit and a snare pad, so they're, they're uh, accustomed to both. Um, typically, though, we do ask if they've had any piano experience. Um, if they do, they're more favorable to be in the percussion family. Our typical instr instrumentation here, especially for this year, uh, we include five marimbas, five vibraphones, a glockenspiel, a couple of mallet auxiliary setups, uh, timpani, a drum set, two synthesizer stations, and we throw in with uh, auxiliary carts, we have the bass drum and chimes and gongs and anything that we can throw in that the music requires. First, I want to give credit where credit is due. Jim Campbell from the University of Kentucky is the one who really embodied the spirit of a concert percussion ensemble sitting at the front of a marching band field or a drum corps field. He was the one who took indigenous styles of African music and Latin music and their instruments alike and then combined them with your typical orchestral percussion instruments. So you have your woods, your xylophones, your marimbas, you have your metals, your vibraphones, glockenspiels and chimes. And then as of recent, we've had a huge introduction into the electronics and all of those effects that go along with it as well. So you'll see from our students today, you'll see the typical setup of woods, metals, electronics, and then all the membrane instruments like drum set and timpani and all the other extra drums that are thrown in the mix as well. The Fisher Show is entitled Chasing Starlight, so it's all about stars and we're using a piece called Radiant Joy and Apollo Unleashed and it really reflects the luminality of the, of the night sky and the stars above. And so you'll see a lot of um, instrumentation that's out there like different bell trees or mark trees or we employ, actually it's a steel drum instrument called a ting. Uh, so like it's the ting man and it's, uh, you'll see it on the snare drums, it's not in the front ensemble, but you'll see uh, all of that coloration of twinkles and sprinkles of, of metallic sounds throughout the show. We also em, em, employ the use of an electronic upright bass, so it's called a silent bass and uh, it, it, it allows us to travel efficiently because it's compact, but it really adds to the, the breadth of the music that we're playing. We, our second number is a jazz piece, uh, Little Girl Blue, uh, made famous by Nina Simone and a few others. But uh, our uh, performing artist on that bass really in, just illuminates the jazz style throughout the, the show. We employ a, a lot of different mics. Um, some of them are very common to what you would see um, in a, in a re recording hall or, or a studio hall. Um, we mic the front ensemble, all the keyboards are mic'd, the drum set is mic'd, the synthesizers are obviously um, enhanced through electronic uh, cabling and so forth. And then we also use four field mics to pick up the range of sound on the field. There's a particular spot in our show where the brass are playing a backfield corral while the woodwinds are doing a woodwind moment and our brass are powerful enough that even facing backfield, we can't hear the woodwinds. So the only way that we can hear them is if we employ a field mic. We're trying to, with all the microphones, capture the essence of sound. We're not trying to like overplay and make it obnoxious, but we want it to feel like the fidelity of sound 
is right at our fingertips. So it's more of a three-dimensional presence of the sound. And, and some of it too is, I mean, brass, uh, brass players through their instrument project through their bell. And it's almost like a laser uh, beam to the press box where a woodwind is more of an, of an omni sound. So it's just, it's just being spread out around them. It's not really going in any directional. So it's, it's omnidirectional, but it's really not going to any one particular location. When miking a marimba or a vibraphone, there's two options. Some people use the Shure SM57, which is a pretty direct mic. Um, it, it, if you use something like that, you probably want to at least use three mics to pick up the full range of the instrument. What we use here is the Audio Technical 2035. It's, it's a condenser mic. So it picks up a wider pattern. The only dangerous thing about that is it picks up a lot of what you have on the field. So it's really important that you have mallet bags across the front of the instrument in front of the player's knees. That'll help shield some of that overage of sound that might come through the mics. So for example, um, the, the microphone, the field mics might be off and the front ensemble's playing something and the battery's behind them, but you want more front ensemble. So you turn the front ensemble up and actually what you're turning up is the whole field. So you wanna be smart about um, how you're doing that. The orientation of the mic is really important as well. That is, it is, it is some, somewhat facing a little forward, not directly forward as it can produce feedback, but if you have it aimed towards the back, it's get, gonna definitely pick up what's coming from behind. Um, and the other part about that too is the placement of the mic. So if a lot of your literature in the show is at the bottom and middle end of the, of the range of the keyboard, well, that's where you want your mic's placement to, to be placed. So you would just wanna make sure that um, they're angled in a way and they're in the, within the range of the instrument. A lot of times too, we'll see a lot of microphones uh, be placed at the top end of the marimba. Well, those are gonna speak well, well more than the mid range. So we, we really frequently don't ever, you know, put a mic up at the top end. It's more of the middle and the lower end of the keyboards. In order to shield from any kind of frame noise or anything of that nature, uh, the mics that we use, the Audio Technica 2035s, they have a shock mount. So if you bump the board or what have you, all of the, the strands that are holding the mic are gonna absorb that sound. So there's no direct contact. You're not gonna hear that frame noise through the speakers. Some of your smaller programs might use an amplifier of sorts that could um, be plugged into a computer and through a keyboard. Some of the programs might be able to find um, perhaps a product that's in a less ex expensive price range that can produce a nice piano sound or an electric piano sound. Um, for us, uh, even the advanced groups and some of the, you know, the, the intermediate groups, there's a great program out there called Mainstage. And it could be put onto a, a Mac computer that usually is provided by the school district. I would just say ask the district if you can have that to help your, your kiddos perform better. But a Mainstage is a, is a pretty inexpensive program that you can hook up a USB MIDI controller, just a keyboard, which you, you can buy for $100 if you want. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It doesn't have to have weighted keys but you have direct contact to hundreds of sounds and, and you can build your own um, scenes and build your own channels of different, different sections of the show. So you can have a piano section one moment and then with a click of a down arrow, you have an organ or, or you have a choir. So you can really help enhance uh, your program sound. I think with a smaller program, the general tendency is to go right to electronics right away. Um, they feel like, well, we're a smaller band, we need more sound, so let's mic everything and perhaps the band's out of tune, or they're out of time, or the timbre of sound isn't what they need it to be. So that's having microphones on the field or in the front ensemble might not necessarily help, it might hinder. So one has to be very careful about that. And I would say first focus on your tuning and focus on your timing and focus on the ensemble playing together and how they're listening to each other and where they're watching and where they're listening to the battery for timing and so forth. And then as they're ready to dip into the electronic thing, go gently, you know, one step at a time. Let's, let's work to um, enhance, but not to cover everything up. A lot of times, smaller groups who go into this right away have a tendency to overbalance with electronics. There are three things I would encourage for all directors with front ensemble. Number one is make sure that they play an exercise program together. They learn how to move and groove and pulse together. Because when there's equal communication back and forth from player to player, the pulse is gonna be much, much more established. The second thing is, I would say, don't just double the flute in the woodwind parts. Um, a lot of times, especially for us in the Midwest, for any of you guys that are anywhere in the colder weather, when temperature goes south and pitch goes up, 
there's a because the instruments in the front ensemble don't change. You can't retune a marimba and a vibraphone, but you can retune your wind instruments. So just be careful how we work at orchestrating uh, the material that they're being played. That's not always doubled because you get into that later October, early November season and it, the pitch doesn't sound that great. And then number three is don't overwrite. Don't cover up all of what the wind ensemble behind is playing. Use the front ensemble when you want them to shine write a moment, like create that, uh, design that moment in the show for them to show off their technique or all the compulsories that they need to play. But please don't overwrite while everybody else is trying to play. Um, and then the other thing I would say, the fourth thing I would say is that the, the front ensemble should always listen back to timing. They should never just watch the drum major in front of them. If they do, they're always going to be ahead. You think about how sound travels. And if they're playing the same passage, or near a passage as the woodwinds and their sound gets to the audience before the woodwinds, we're gonna have timing issues. We plug in the, the front ensemble, the marimbas and the vibraphones, we do what we call the daisy chain system. So we have groupings of side one and side two. So two of the vibes will then daisy chain into each other. So vibe one cable will run and plug in the vibe two. And then vibe two will have another cable for vibe one and two. And then this then runs up to the keyboard over here and then everything just connects across. And then we go to what we call a modular snake and everything's runs from here, from this keyboard and it runs up to the soundboard up front. So basically we have um, keyboards, drum set, synths and speakers. So we have basically four lines in instead of 32. The array speakers are nicer just because when you set these up in the stadium, you don't have to make your own, you know, the old speakers, they would just be flat. You'd have to build some kind of a thing to tilt them up. And based on the array of these, I mean, it, it casts an audio sound that comes out. And obviously with this, it, this goes up. Some groups have, you'll see some of the drum cores have three or four of these. I know not every program has that. So, if you have the opportunity at least to get two subs and uh, you know even even an, an array and then add on these are things that are very easy to add on um, to but the nice thing that the the whole activity has gone to where the speakers are powered so we're not carrying extra weight around in a sound system it, whether it's in the mixer rack or it's in any of the keyboard racks um, all of the amplification is coming directly from here and then what what needs to happen though is um, we have uh, these power cables that are back here, right? And th these power cables are all interconnected and plugged in, and they go to these things called a, a power con. The nice thing about the power con is you just can't unplug it. To, to unplug it, you have to twist and turn, and, and it's, it's a safety measure. Um, but what we do is we run all the power cons to one location. So, for example, this speaker has its, its data, its audio feed, and it's power con, and it goes and directly imports into this cabinet, okay? Um, and you'll see that this is running from there. And then these are the different speaker lines. So this is our right, this is our left, this is our center fill. And as you can see, we have our right, left, and center fill. These are all connected, much like I talked about before with the marimbas, where we have one uh, cable running to here, then we have two cables running to there, then we have three running to here. Um, and it's just an easier way to, to, to hook it up. And then below the, the speakers here, we have a drum set power cable, and then we have an ethernet cable. And then below that is also the synth power and then the ethernet cable. Everybody's moving to the ethernet cables now. Um, and what, what that is, is basically if you follow this line back here to the drum set, I'll, um, I have to go walk around this way. But our drum set has what we call a stage box, and the stage box has 16 channels. So we have all of the mics on the drum set. And what, what we did here is we just got a, a, an Audix drum pack. So we just got a typical drum mic pack, um, and then we're just running all of the cables through here. One of the nice things that, that I love about our team is you notice how these cables are wrapped and zip tied. They're nice and clean. So from the front, you really don't see anything. And then all of those cables run to this digital snake. So these are all of our drum set mics. Okay. And then this, this is basically another, uh, it's a, it's a four channel um, ethercon 
box. Okay, this one is made by Lux. And what this is, that's an Ethernet cable. So what happens is we run the field mics, which go from here all the way over to where the field mics are, and then we're running one cable instead of four. So instead of running four field mics, four um, soloist mics, eight drum set mics, and running them all up to the mixer, we're running basically two cables. So we're saving time, and it, it helps with the setup very, very quickly. We use the pageantry innovations carts here because everybody uses them. All the drum cores use them, all the top groups use them. Um, we've had this particular cart now for about five years. We've never had an issue. All the, all the welds hold. They're very strong. Um, it, as you can tell, it's really clean and really defined. We love that everything has a cover. So if we do get into the elements, like this whole piece comes out and they can move up and then see so it can come out and then lifts it up and it covers and, and everything's protected. Um, you can easily throw a tarp on over that. But we love this because um, uh, just the, everything about it is, is, is industry standard and there's lots of space. Foam? Yeah, so this is, this is a dense foam, so it helps absorb um, any of the, you know, the ride in the truck or, you know, th that's the one thing about the front ensemble is this, all of this equipment that we play on, the marimas and vibes, I mean, we've had innovations and iterations of the frames and being stronger for the uh, frame use, for the outdoor use, but really, truly, this equipment was really never meant for the outside. So, um, you know, groups like pageantry innovations and some of the instrument manufacturers um, they have gone to great lengths to make sure that the equipment is protected and as things go over a, a rocky road or a hill or a bump that things don't break and fall apart so that's one of the reasons why we love the pageantry frames but as you notice there's a whole opportunity for a rack mounted unit for winter percussion we'll use this as our sound cart we'll put a, a, mat, a rack mixer in here instead of a regular mixer, and we'll just control everything from an iPad. We chose to use the mixer up front this year just because we need more, more space, we need more mics. Um, but yeah, and then what we do over here is we take this keyboard, which has its power source and its microphone lines, which come out of a DI box. Um, we go into here from the computer into a USB hub, simple USB cable, okay? And then this, this then goes into uh, this DI box, and the DI box comes out, travels over to here, and we have an input back here with the two line ins from the synth and the power from that synth. This is basically an extension cord, but with a lock, if you will. And then that's where it's getting its power and its sound. And if you look over here, here's one of those cables that I showed on the drum set. So these two cables are from this synth, these two cables are from the, pr the other synth next to it. And then we run this one cable out to the mixer. And I'll show you that cable. So that's coming out from over here. We have the cables from the next door synth and this synth go in here. This Ethernet cable, which comes out here along with the power cable runs along to that mixer, and then that's how we're getting signal to the mixer. All right, so this, uh, too, is a pageantry innovations cart. It's a, what we call a double wide cart. Um, it houses two banks of uh, spaces for you to put all of your, your goodies. Um, we have our wireless mics here. As you can see right now, we're only using three, but we'll employ the other uh, seven in here as well. These are the, um, the, sh the short wireless systems, as well as antennas. These antennas, all of these systems plug into the antenna, and then these antennas then hook up, and that's what goes to this, which help uh, the RF signal feed out to the students. The, op the opportune thing to do is to get them as high as possible, so that way we can avoid um, all of the bodies blocking the sound. Um, this, by the way, is uh, a modular snake, which uh, plugs uh, all the marimbas and vibes. They run these cables here, so this is coming from one of the marimbas, uh, side one, Vibe and Marimbas on the left, and this is side two, Vibes and Marimbas on the right. They'll plug into here, and it, this is conducive to, uh, well, it's, it's more efficient because this is 16, or this is eight channels, and this is eight channels, so combine the 16 channels. And instead of running 16 cables, you're running two. So it really just helps. And then this then 
Um, there's an Ethernet cable in the back of this, which then inputs into our Behringer wing mixing console. The most important thing about this cart is this battery backup. Um, the reason for that is when you get to the show and you have about 10 minutes before you take the field, this thing can run anywhere between uh, 20 minutes to 25 minutes long. Um, you could power on your whole sound system and make sure that all of your wireless components are working, your frequencies are set and working, and they don't clash with anything with any of the, the nearby frequencies. But you can make sure that everything's powered on, ready to go before you actually start anything. And if you do have a pre-show that starts the show, you're ready to go. You just push play and you're, and you're all set. Uh, we do get um, power um, supplied to us from the stadium. The good thing that is is that if power does go out, this will keep it running. So sound doesn't go out, the, the performance isn't affected, and the kids have a, a successful run. Okay, that was a ton of information. First off, because this group is to the minute with their schedules and rehearsals, we never actually got the chance to officially thank Fishers High School and Chad Kohler and the entire staff and marching band. So we're gonna take the time to do that now. Thank you so much for granting us the time to showcase one of the best marching bands in the country. And just so you know, their show capturing Starlight got them their highest placement ever at BOA Grand Nationals last year. So congratulations to the Tiger Marching Band on that accomplishment. And thanks again for all the great information regarding your front ensemble. As you saw in the video, we carry a lot of the things that you might need for your front ensemble. Links for those things are in the description below. We also have an interview with composer and arranger Richard Saucedo, another legend in the world of marching arts. So check that video out as well, also in the description. And Pepper is diving more into the marching arts products, including gear for Color Guard. We have lots of great content coming soon featuring the Color Guard, the original front ensemble, some might say. So please be sure to follow us on social media or check out our blog queued in to see any of that content. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of the new content that we have coming out at JW Pepper.